Hi everyone, Andrew for Pocus Abbey Plus. Uh, this is part two of my 50 big blind series, which I was doing at $25 no limit. Um, this is exactly where I left off from part one. If you haven't seen part one, it's not really required viewing. Uh, I do go over a bit of an introduction as to the games in general, uh, which you might find interesting. So, um, you know, check it out, um, but not essential viewing. Uh, we finished part two on this hand, the top right, uh, sorry, top left table, uh, Queen 10, where I decided that um, folding the turn was going to be best versus an unknown player's range. Um, you know, it's a pretty tight fold, obviously. I think that calling is going to be fine, um, but I just really didn't want to be guessing on the river, and I think that um, just to expand my explanation, um, I can pretty easily calculate the uh, the profitability of folding. Uh, obviously, the profitability of folding is zero always. Um, but I can establish that if it is a mistake, it's going to be quite a small one, uh, just because the hands that I'm currently ahead of still do have reasonable equity against me. So if I'm making a mistake by folding my queen 10 here, it's going to be quite a small mistake. But I'm unable to calculate the profitability of calling because I don't understand his turn frequencies or his river, fre river frequencies. So I might end up making uh, you know, quite a significant mistake by calling and then check calling uh, various rivers. I also might be making a mistake by folding various rivers, so it's difficult to establish uh, whether or not continuing will be profitable, but I can establish that um, folding is not going to be a significant mistake, so I decided to just clean up the hand and, and check fold. Um, if you want some more analysis on that hand, you can check out the end of part one. Okay, so uh, on the top right table, I have king six. Um, one of the things that um, that was really huge um, in this session was stealing dead money. Um, I found that to be just incredibly profitable, um, as it always is. That's in small stakes games, you know, there's not a real big surprise, but there were a lot of times where I was isolating or raising preflop and I just took it down without any contest. Um, if you take a look at what's happened on the top right here, um, the pot was 70 cents preflop and I've raised it to one and I believe in this hand that I just go ahead and take it down. Um, that's really, really reasonable for a preflop situation. I've risked one to which to win 70 um, solely on the preflop action, and it works. And I found that it does work most of the time. Um, so particularly, even though there was a limper in here, and I think, um, I don't know why that 10 cents is there. I think someone might have posted or something. Um, but all that dead money is just so profitable. For me to take it down with such good odds, uh, you know, $1 into 70 preflop is very, very good. And then obviously postflop I can make... Um, really good decisions because I'm on the button. Um, but the power of taking down the dead money is uh, is really significant. Um, it seems like particularly so in these games, just because people seem to love to um, just play really passively. Um, the Queen Jack, I'm a little bit deeper here, so you know, pretty standard call. Uh, I wouldn't really ever 3-bet this hand just because it's such a nice hand to play. Um, uh, in a small pot, even out of position, it doesn't play too badly. Uh, just because uh, it has a lot of drawing potential and uh, you're generally going to flop very, very strong draws or decent top pairs or middle pairs and stuff, so it's going to be a reasonably um, simple hand to play. It's one of my favorite hands, actually, Queen Jack suited.